And welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. I love doing these podcasts, by the way, and I hope that you appreciate this podcast. We bring such a diverse number of people together through the podcast. The last one I did was with a man named Tristan Osbey. He's the only government official in the world that has the moniker Persecuted Christians in his title. And he's the state secretary for Hungary and has raised some $50 million to help persecuted Christians. Four out of every five are persecuted Christians. And we live in a time in which unity of Christians is so transcendently important. I've often said that it is true to say that if we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately. So there's a great need within the body of Christ for unity. And that is the subject of today's podcast. The podcast is based on a book that is titled Until Unity. It's a book written by my friend Francis Chan. Francis has been a pastor for over 30 years. He's a best-selling author. He's written some incredible books, including a book titled Crazy Love, as well as a book titled Letters to the Church. And then with his dear wife, Lisa, he has co-authored a book that is titled You and Me Forever. But again, we're going to focus on a book that has just recently been released. It's titled Until Unity. You can get your copy for your support of our ministry on the web at equip.org. Simply go to the web at equip.org, and when you support the ministry, we'll send you the book. You can also write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. And today's podcast is with someone that certainly meets our mission statement. We want to bring the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds. We have had so many people give us five-star ratings from around the world. I'll just read one. It's by Michael. He's a follower of Christ. He says, I'm so glad that I stumbled upon this podcast. I love listening to Hank's personal testimony and journey with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I love the guests that are brought to the show to share their thoughts and stories. Every time I listen, I find myself strengthened and encouraged in my faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I am motivated to grow closer and study God, His Word, and the historical church of believers who came before me. Just one of many of the reviews of the Hank Unplugged podcast. Well, with that, I want to welcome my good friend, Francis Chan. And Francis, as always, it is just great to have a conversation with you. Thanks, Hank. Gosh, I've really appreciated our friendship and have learned so much over the years through you. So it's an honor to be on the podcast. In your book, Until Unity, I remember you and I being in Dallas together and talking about how necessary unity is. I wrote about this in my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. Last chapter is a chapter on fusion, and I call that the secret to global transformation. In the scientific or physical realm, Fusion means that you take hydrogen atoms and you try to make them fuse. And hydrogen atoms, by their very nature, want to repel. So the only place that those atoms actually fuse is in the sun. We don't find that fusion practical on Earth. Instead, what we do is we split atoms, and that division of the atoms does create tremendous power, but it also creates tremendous toxicity radioactive waste. And I think that's an apt analogy for the body of Christ. We are called to fuse, but so often we gravitate towards fission or division. And you're calling the body of Christ in the 21st century towards unity. And I suppose 
the first question I have for you, and it might set the table for everything else we discuss, is isn't this, Francis, an impossible dream? <laughs> it is and it isn't. I mean, if you look at it in the flesh, you go, gosh, we are so divided and it seems to get worse every day. And it seems like we have tried everything humanly possible to bring the church back together. And it hasn't worked. And so people far more brilliant, far more gifted than me have tried to bring it together. So it does seem impossible. And yet you look at Scripture and you think about what Christ did, what God did to make us one with him. I mean, that was, that was way more impossible, mm. us becoming one with a holy God, sinful man and holy God coming together, and yet he made a way because he wanted it. It was his desire, so he made it possible. And so I go, okay, if he did that, he can also bring his body together even now at the most fractured state that, uh, you know, in church history that I know of, um, he could do it. And so I, I, I believe in humility if we seek after him and I just humbly say, uh, we have no answers at this point, Lord. Uh, we've made a mess of things. Uh, please save us. I, I believe he'll provide a way. Mm. You know, I often think, Francis, when I ask that very question that I posed to you about realism, is this an impossible dream? And yet the Lord prayed that we all might be one, just as the Father is in me and I am in the Father, may be one in them, so that the world might believe that God sent his Son to die for the sins of the world. So whenever we ask the question, how realistic, we have to immediately catch ourselves. Do we really have the temerity to ask the Lord God Most High, the one in whose presence we could not so much as stand, whether his prayer to the Father might actually be realistic? How can an infinitesimally tiny speck of dust question the one who created that dust? We can pose questions only because the breath of heaven is blown on us. The question, therefore, is not one of realism, but one of obedience. And this is something that you point out in the book over and over again. We have to be obedient to the high priestly prayer of God, of God in human flesh, God incarnate, his prayer to the Father, that we might be one just as he and the Father are one. Yeah. Well, and it even says in uh, chapter 17, verse 22, he says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. And this is what makes it possible, is that he's given us the glory. You know, how, how you interpret that or how we understand that perfectly, it, it's a mystery. But somehow the glory that was given to Jesus, he says he's given to us mm -hmm. so that we are capable of becoming perfectly one. So for us to say it's impossible, we really are calling God a liar. And it's interesting because that whole passage, you know, that whole upper room discourse you know, starting back in, in John 14, when he says, in my father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? He says, if, if this isn't true, why would I say it? Why would I say I'm going to prepare a place for you if there's not really room for you? And I take that all the way to chapter 17, where he says, well, I just said that I gave you my glory so that you become perfectly one. Why would I say that if it's not true? God's not like man where you and I might slip and say something we don't really mean or not follow through on something we promised. 
when God says something, he says, why would you even question it if it came out of my mouth? And so I, I have to run with that. That's what our faith is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And in this discussion and in your book, you really have to start with the end goal in mind. And the end goal is, in essence, another iteration of Pentecost, the mighty blowing wind, the tongues of fire, a church empowered by the Holy Spirit, a church that is one, that absolutely turns the world right side up and does it in a very short period of time, relatively speaking. And you have the faith to believe. I remember reading this at the end of your book. You have the faith to believe that that can happen, not just in the distant future, but in our own lifetimes. Yeah. I'm really excited about this because, you know, you've, you've got this younger generation that they don't understand the division. It doesn't make sense to them. Some of us that are older, you know, we've tried to make sense of it over the years, but at the end of the day, we have to see the scriptures and go, this doesn't make sense at all. And I actually dream about my kids growing up in a church that doesn't have to explain, well, this is why, you know, you shouldn't listen to these guys and these guys and these guys and these guys and these guys, and these guys even though they're all believers. You know, we keep our distance from them and them and them and them. You know, I want them to grow up in a church that actually goes, wow, if that person is truly a believer, then God commands me to become perfectly one with them. And for them to grow up in a church that just emphasizes that type of love and commitment to each other, I don't know. I, I may be crazy, but I, I really believe it can happen. I really believe this is God's desire. And I know, you know, when you're writing and you're thinking, you're going, gosh, I don't know if it's necessarily, you know, wrong to have all these different tribes, but I don't know. I am dreaming of a, I don't know, breaking down of some of that. So the name of Christ would be the only thing that is lifted up, the only name, not Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, you know, Episcopal. It's just not North American Baptist and Baptist General Conference. And it's just that's all so confusing to the young minds of why it has to be that way. And it's certainly confusing to the unbelieving world. And so I am dreaming and praying for a day when all the believers are one in spirit, but also in name. Yeah, let's talk about that for a moment. You know, you're alluding to this, but I wrote in my book about a rhetorical question that was asked by St. Paul, is Christ divided. And there are factious people at this time who are saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. And then again, Paul says, is Christ really divided? And so the problem with factionalism in the ancient church, just like today, is not one of tribes, the tribe of Paul or the tribe of Apollos or the tribe of of Cephas, but I'm contending in my book, and maybe incorrectly, I'm contending that the real problem is tribalism, that we are competitors as opposed to co-workers in the fellowship of the undivided trinity, that there can be distinctives, and we don't have to break down all of those distinctives as long as they're secondary issues, and as long as we manifest what is so manifest in your book, we manifest the love of Christ. So again, we're not competitors, but we're co-laborers. And so, yeah, we're going to have some differences and perhaps unrealistic that all of those barriers are broken down because their barriers erected on secondary issues and they've sort of taken on a life of their own. So I've kind of thought, well, get rid of the tribalism, but the tribes may continue. But you're saying that you want to take it a step further. Yeah, I mean, I just, 
it's so hard to explain, you know, like I remember just sharing with my taxi driver and, and he's just like, yeah, you, the Christians, you guys just don't make any sense, you know, Catholic, are you Orthodox? Are you Baptist? Are you this, 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 you guys can't even get along. And, you know, and he was saying, you know, and I, he goes, I, I grew up Muslim, but you know, at least we're pretty connected and, you know, we have two factions, but that's better than you guys. You know, he's just confused by it all. And I, there's not a great answer to that. I just go, yeah, I know. All right. Just, just don't look at the church. You know, let's, let's just go to truth. Let's just go to the scripture. You know, let me just pray for you in the name of Jesus. And I almost had to, uh, I, I don't know. I've never been able to explain it well to an unbeliever. And it's hard for me to imagine that this was Christ's intention. Well, I don't think it was the intention. I think you're absolutely right about that. But by the way, the Muslims are pretty divided as well. So the taxi driver is probably not aware that there are Sufis and Sunnis and Shiites and there are Wahhabs and, you know, there are all kinds of divisions within Islam, lots of divisions within Hinduism. So we are divided, and that is a reproach upon the name of Christ. But many religious groups are systemically divided as well. But I think, getting back to your main point, I mean, you think about the schisms that took place, and you're familiar with those schisms. I mean, the great schism that took place between the East and the West was really a sin of fratricide. In other words, instead of working in collegial, conciliar fashion, the churches began to divide the East from the West, and eventually in 1054, the Western Church sends a bull of excommunication to the Eastern Church over the Filioque, over changing what was decided in Nicaea in 325 and then Constantinople right after that. And they messed with the faith, and very, very interesting, they were the ones to excommunicate the East. And so now you have this big fissure that leaves a blackened lava trail between East and West. And then 500 years later, you have a big schism that takes place in the Western Church between Rome and the Reformers, and then the Church continues to fissure after that one fissuring after the other. And some of this has to do with the essentials of the historic Christian faith. And I suppose the operative question in terms of unity is, what are the essentials that we can ultimately unify around? I mean, if we talk about getting rid of all barriers, I mean, we have to start by talking about what are the essentials of the historic Christian faith. And there's a lot of debate about that. Yeah. So, you know, Zwingli comes along after Luther and says, look, I don't think baptism is a sacrament. In essence, he's saying baptism is something that God does, not for us, but something we're doing for God. Zwingli believes in infant baptism. The Anabaptists come along and say, that's anathema. And then you have fissuring that takes place with respect to essentials of the Christian faith. I mean, Luther believed in the real presence of Christ, but Zwingli did not. Is that an essential or is that a secondary issue? I mean, those are the issues that ultimately have to be grappled with. Yeah, it's it's so hard when we... uh, Well, first, I, I just want to say, gosh, to anyone that's listening when you hear about that schism, I mean, isn't there something inside of you, I would argue a person of the Holy Spirit, that just your heart breaks because of the division? Like, you want this oneness. I mean, when I hear about all these different divisions, I mean, I have to go back to my desire based upon the Spirit that God has placed in me of, I want oneness with the body of Christ. And before we even get into, like, okay, so do we divide on this? Do we divide on that? It starts off with, in your inner person, when you read these passages, 
passages about the heart of God, the heart of Christ. Lord, I, I want them to become perfectly one. Like, this is God's desire. Do you listen to my voice, listen to Hank's voice, and go, oh, I just want to be perfectly one with them, regardless of what denomination they're a part of. Because it sounds like these men really trust in the blood of Christ for their salvation, and they really do believe in the Holy Spirit and is indwelling in man to make us more like Christ. And I want to be on this journey. I want to be in this family with them. I want to be in this body with them. And you take the Word of God literally that we literally are the body of Christ somehow. And he is the head, and he doesn't want his body divided. And once that desire is in there, and once your desire is, wow, Francis Chan seems like he knows Jesus, and he is a part of the body, I want to love him deeply. I want to love him like I love myself. I want to love him the way that Christ loved me. And I, I really believe that... That ought to be step one. It has to do with the Spirit's indwelling and this desire for oneness and this desire to love one another as Christ loved us. And it's with that foundation of love and desire for oneness that we then speak and start talking about some of these issues and going, okay. God, here we are. We love you. We want to be one. We want you to be the head. And we want to leave here united, more one than ever, as we discuss what are the most important things, what are the critical things. But I think sometimes we get into these discussions without a foundation of love, a desire for oneness as Christ wanted it. And I do think that's important. Doesn't sound real scholarly. It may sound, you know, sophomoric or, you know, just, <laughs> you know, that's cute. Okay, yeah, I love each other, but let's get to the facts. But I'm going. To, I I really believe that as we come in love, unified, that that's when God is going to reveal truth to us. Because as we learn from Corinthians, as you were quoting, the pursuit of truth isn't all about intellectual discussion. In fact, it is a gift, and it's something that is of the Spirit, that the spiritual man will receive. Now, it involves study, because the Bible calls us to that, but there's something much deeper that goes on, and there's a, there's a transferring of truth from God himself that is not merely, you know, a, a fact going into my ears, and uh, then translating through my brain, and now I come to know truth. There's something that God does, and that's why we need to be so obedient in our love for one another and the obedience to His commands, so that when we come together to hopefully figure out what really is essential. You kind of say that in a video that you released. I mean, in essence, you're saying that if your eyes are on God, then it's really hard to be critical of other people. So if you picture yourself with Jesus in front of you, and you're in a line, and your eyes are in Jesus, you see your own imperfections, and you're less likely to see the imperfections in other people. If you turn around in that line, and you look at the person that's standing behind you, so your eyes are no longer on the Lord, but rather on that person, it is easy to be critical. Yeah. So I think your point there is well taken. And you're also talking about the significance of love, and I would say vicariously with that, humility. And this is the essence of what Jesus said were the, the first two great commandments. You have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you have to love your neighbor as yourself. So your focus is, first of all, turning our attention to God, and then we see our own frailty, uh, imperfections, and when we're focused in that way on the Lord, a lot of the disagreements 
they peel off by osmosis almost by themselves. Yeah. I mean, we see our frailness. We see our sinfulness. We see his thoughts just being infinitely higher than ours. And it feels silly to compare my thoughts versus your thoughts, right? In the presence of God. I mean, it's like, what is the gap between Hank's mind and my mind? And I believe there is a gap, but even the gap of truth, like who, you know, it's so small compared to the gap between God's mind and ours. And we recognize that and we humbly bow before this God who is so brilliant, we can't even fathom all of his thinking and his thoughts. We're not in the same league. But then we recognize his desire for us and the lengths he went to erase our sin and bring us into his presence. And at that point, when I'm at his feet, I understand his holiness as much as I can. And then I recognize his grace and mercy on me. Gosh, I should just be absolutely undone, blown away, weeping, sobbing, going, God, how could you be so good? And then if you're next to me at his feet, screaming the same type of thing to Almighty God, and then it's like, okay, now we can have a discussion, because we're two people who are so enamored by him, so amazed by him, that spend time trembling before him and weeping before him and laughing before him because he is our joy and he is so good. And we come together, you know, we greet one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I tell you about my time with the Lord this morning. Oh, Hank, at a beautiful time, just just walking for a couple miles in nature and praying to him and, and understanding his love for me. And I, and I tell you about what God's been showing me, and, and I greet you in that way. You know, it's after all of that, then let's have some discussions. And I think God would bless that, but too often we get straight to business. And that's why I had even written, you know, about all the problems in the church. And that was like the introduction and chapter one. And I thought, oh, Lord, I don't want to start like this. This is what we do. We go straight to a problem and we forget about your grace in our lives. And so I take people to worship and go, let's bow before him before we get into anything. Let's just tell him how wonderful he is. And if you didn't wake up doing that this morning, then you're part of the problem. You know, you think your mind is needed to solve problems before your mind is needed to just adore him and worship him and just be present silently before him. Yeah, and front with humility. I mean, I I would think for everybody listening in, it would be imperative to understand that you and I are having a conversation. We don't have it all figured out. Yeah. There's a lot about the mechanics of unity, whether you talk about it with respect to truth or you talk about it with respect to love. There's a lot of it that we don't have completely figured out. So we're having a conversation, not as people that, okay, we have the template, we can make this happen, but we're discussing this because we think this needs to be the center of our focus. We need to work towards unity as opposed to disunity. And there is, therefore, a discussion in this conversation about the Apostle Paul. One of the passages I I memorized many, many years ago was the passage in Acts chapter 20, where the Apostle Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem. He is pretty sure that he's going to lose his life eventually, and he's talking to the people in Jerusalem about what's going to happen in the future. And then in the midst of that, 
He's warning them, watch over yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather a great number of people around them to tell them what their itching ears want to hear. So he says, watch over the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So the Apostle Paul was concerned about false teachers that would come into the church and disrupt the unity of the church. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because, you know, you have that passage where, you know, even within that story, you have Paul who wants to go to Jerusalem knowing his fate, and then there's others that are begging him not to go because they know of his fate. You know, you have disagreement even in that situation, and yet it's this beautiful, tearful, and also like, I'm worried about you guys. I, I know these savage wolves are coming, and you have to be so careful. The difficulty I think nowadays is Everyone's fighting about who those wolves are, and I think both you and I have been accused of being those wolves, you know, from different people, and then you've got all these different people looking to that without considering, and and, and I, I thank God for a pursuit of truth and those who pursue truth, but I would just warn those, and I think most people listening to your podcast are people who want truth, but there is a tendency of those who want truth to belittle the command for unity. And I am not saying we sacrifice truth for the sake of unity, but I am saying that I I don't think we can sacrifice unity for the sake of truth either. We are to pursue both and there will be conversations where we go, gosh, I don't know if that is Christianity anymore. There's a distortion of the gospel that at some point Paul says, okay, that person is accursed. We don't follow that person anymore. And I am not saying we don't have those discussions. I'm just saying I think we've been very flippant about that. And talking about people that I am very confident are brothers in the Lord and somehow saying we need to disassociate with them. That's dangerous ground that we're walking on when we do that. Think about for a moment, Francis, what's going on in the current milieu. You have people within the church that are willing to decouple gender from biological sex. I mean, that goes to a foundational principle that God ordered at the very inception of the human condition. You have people, a whole denomination, Church of England, where they are now working with trained Marxists to reimagine the church. So you've got major issues within the church. I mean, not just arguing about small things, but we're talking about a reimagining of what the church actually is. And it seems to me, as you've correctly pointed out, that this is not a time to say we can't talk about truth, we have to talk about unity, or vice versa. I mean, both are twin pillars necessary to hold up what Christ established. I mean, and when we're talking about the church itself, I mean, Paul calls the church the ground and pillar of truth. It's primary. So we're not talking about a secondary issue here. It is the church that gave us the Bible. It is the church that passed on what was believed everywhere, always and by all. So we're talking about the organism within the world that Christ created to be salt and light, to be a leavening force in the culture. So when the culture now invades the church, I mean, that's a place where there has to be a pushback. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's truth, and it's 
purity, which comes from the truth, you know, the obedience to the commands. I mean, that is the time when Paul does say that there is a time to disassociate because it's that important. The holiness of the church is that important, the purity. And so when there are the, you know, in 1 Corinthians 5, when he talks about those who are sexually immoral of, you know, the greedy, the swindlers, the idolaters. He's talking about anyone who calls himself a believer, but is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not to even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God will judge those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So again, it's not unity at any cost. There is a time to purge these people, and God wants his church to be holy. I mean, we see that with Ananias and Sapphira. We see it early on in the church. God wanted us to be serious about holiness. And again, it's, you know, it's those who love unity just like earlier, I said those who, who love truth can have a tendency to neglect unity. And I would say those who tend to focus on unity often don't have a strong stand against sin or deception or false teaching. And we're commanded to all of that. And so somehow by the Spirit of God, we can humbly and gently pursue it and like you said earlier, we don't have that figured out. We're just humbly coming before God and say, please, Lord, help me every step of the way. Even as you mentioned the different factions that are going on right now and some of the things that are creeping into the church, I can't even keep up with all of the different heresies that are, you know, that are out there and all the things that are being said. <laughs> and it's so hard to find truth as I hear people say things about different denominations or leaders, then you, you know, oftentimes you talk to those leaders and they go, that's not at all what I meant. And you and I have lived the life of that, of being misunderstood and misinterpreted and misrepresented by other people. It's all I'm saying is from the flesh, it feels pretty impossible to even know who to confront and how strongly to confront them sometimes. You talk about the importance of being on our knees, and that's not just lip service. I mean, I've been with you, and we've been dealing with some pretty weighty matters, and then you say, let's just go pray. And you get on your knees, and it's very, very hard to be antagonistic in either heart or thought when you're actually kneeling with someone else. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the passage that I chose, you know, for the title of the book comes from Ephesians 5, talking about until we, you know, come to this unity of the faith. But he starts off that chapter saying, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, he starts off, and it, it says, this is how we live a life worthy of the calling. It's with all humility and gentleness. Oh, gosh. I mean, how many debates have we been a part of and seen and watched, listened to, where you saw that they came to each other with all humility and gentleness? That's the way that believers are supposed to carry themselves. And that humility towards each other happens as we spend time close to God. This is something God has been showing me lately. You know, I, I used to, I would, you know, like I listened to one interview I did it not that long ago either, and I'm going, oh, God, I was proud at that moment. 
I sound proud. I sound defensive. I'm sorry, Lord. You know, kill my pride. But then it was like he revealed to me that it's not just about pride. It's about nearness to God. Because when we are truly near to him, you can't be proud. Any human being that came into the presence of God was immediately humbled. And so my lack of humility shows that I'm not close to God at that moment. And that's the tragedy, because if I really see myself in the presence of God, I'm not going to sound arrogant, because I'm not going to be arrogant. And so when I hear the lack of humility or lack of gentleness as people are or fighting, or arguing, or, you know, slandering someone. I don't just pray anymore, God, oh, you know, humble them. I go, God, pour your grace on them. Draw them near to you. Because when I'm near to you, I can't help but be humble. It's when I'm far from you that the sin can creep into my life, and I can start looking at myself and start defending myself and start believing more highly of myself than I am. One of the things I love about your book is your transparency. You talk about the sin creeping into your own life. You confess in the book, as it were, that you are a person that can rightly be accused in your life, the span of your life, of having been guilty of sowing discord And then you point out that God hates those who sow discord among the brothers. You quote from, I think it's Proverbs chapter 6, where there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, and one is sowing discord among the brothers. So you're not just there pointing your finger at someone else and saying, those people are sowing discord. You say, I look over the span of my own life, and you say, I've done it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, even you saying it right now breaks my heart again. I was thinking, God, I hate that I did that. This is so sacred. We're talking about his body. We're talking about God Almighty. We're talking about Christ himself and his very body, and I divided it. I've hurt the body. You know, I've in some ways destroyed the unity of the body. And God has strong words for people like that. And it was my my knowledge that, you know, or supposed knowledge or believed knowledge that did puff me up, like the scriptures said, and my lack of love. It was just knowledge, 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 and going, well, you don't understand this like I do. I have said some very sarcastic and slanderous things about people that I now consider dear brothers and examples to me. And it really kills me. I'm not just saying that. It There's a fear, there's a righteous fear before God, like, oh, Lord, I am so sorry, and I am so grateful for your grace in my life, so grateful for the grace that came from those brothers and sisters whom I've slandered and have asked forgiveness for. I don't know. I mean, I'm a I'm a competitive person too. Like, I if we compete in anything, I mean, we haven't golfed yet together, but you'll see that come out. It's just my flesh, and it's just I'm competitive, and I I want to win, and so that means at times I want others to lose. Well, and by the way, just on that subject, I'm sorry you brought that up, but when we do play golf, and we've been talking about that, as you said, I am going to take you down. (laughs) It's going to happen. I love that challenge. I I highly doubt it. You don't sound afraid. (laughs) No, but you know, so that part of our, you know, whatever you want to call it, that side of us can slip into other areas without recognizing it. And I know 
that some of the things I say are purely out of pride, even though in those early days it was like a mixture where I really felt like I was defending truth the best I knew it. But I'm sure even within that, there was a competitive spirit Mm. and there was a a lack of humility and a a desire for people to follow me. You know, one passage, not to go too long on this, but something that's been convicting me is James chapter 3, when it talks about selfish ambition. Mm. In verse 14, he says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So if there is jealousy in me, and doesn't that be rampant and horrible? He goes, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And so for me as a pastor, as a leader, as a speaker, as a Christian minister, when there is selfish ambition, if it exists, if there's any part of me right now that's thinking, okay, how are people viewing Francis Chan right now? What are they thinking of me? If that exists right now, then there's going to follow with that disorder and every bio practice. When I step on a stage and, and there's a part that wants Francis Chan and them leaving with a good feeling about me rather than Halloween. Thy name, you know, when there's jealousy and selfish ambition in there, there's going to be disorder. There is going to be this follow practice. And so I know for a fact that I have stepped on platforms with selfish ambition and with jealousy, and it has led to things coming out of my mouth that lift up Francis Chan rather than hallowed be thy name. And with that will come the disorder, every vile practice, the the unspiritual, earthly, demonic. And that's why when he goes on in chapter four, what causes the quarrels and the fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? There's this selfish ambition And that's leading to this. And we have to get serious about repenting of this, especially Christian leaders. Let's just get real about this. It is a real temptation in America. Anytime you speak on a podcast, from a stage, whatever, for selfish ambition to creep in, I believe it is running rampant and it's leading to these divisions and this vile practice, and really all sorts of disorder within the church. You answer a question in the book about unity. The question being, when is unity easy? And you say the unity of the surrendered is almost effortless. Whenever I meet people who resemble a living sacrifice, what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, having suffered for the gospel, I'm ready to give them the shirt off my back. I feel an immediate affinity and bond in the Spirit. Their lives resemble the life of Christ. Loving them and serving them is an honor because it feels like I am serving Christ himself. So you're answering a question here that I'd love for you to expand on somewhat. You're answering the question when unity becomes easy. Yeah, I just know, and I I think those listening, we've met people, right, in our life where they just have the fragrance of Christ. They just give off that aroma where you go, I don't know every bit of their theology, but as I hear their testimony, not even from their lips, but from those around them, that maybe share stories of, oh, man, I saw her 
suffer in this way for the gospel, and here's how she responded. And, you know, everything inside of you just leaps, like, oh, that is so biblical. That is so congruent with the saints I read about in Scripture. And I honestly, I, I mean, it. it is very simple. I, I think about this couple and in Ethiopia, when I think about the sacrifices they've made, the attacks that they've put up with, and everything else, like I, and just the the aroma of Christ, I mean, the joy. I told their leader, I go, look, I, I love them so much. Like, if there's a choice between one of us starving to death, it's going to be me, okay? In other words, like, Tell me, what is their salary? I will pay their salaries. Their salary is more important than me ever getting another dime. You know, like they are first. I I mean, haven't we all met people like that where you just go, oh, they are so beautiful. I want to be like them. It's not envy. It's like they're so exemplary to me because of their sacrifice that it's a joy. And I don't think I have to talk about that too long. I think just if I give a couple examples, everyone has those examples in their minds. And, you know, the question is, is, am I that type of person? Am I becoming that type of person through my actions, through my sacrifice, through my gentleness and humility, and through the aroma of Christ that comes through me? Uh, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, is that flowing through me where people see evidence of the Holy Spirit and, you know, you want to be on the same team. It's kind of like if, you know, you go up to the park for a game of pickup basketball and you just see guys that are so gifted, you're like, oh, I hope I'm on his team. I want to jump on to his team You want to immediately be unified with them. I guess I'm saying the same thing in the Christian world. There are those that are so spirit-filled and live such a godly, sacrificial life that you immediately go, I want to be one with them. I don't want to be against him. I do not want to be against her. I want them on the same team. I remember a few years ago when you stayed at my house, and I remember one poignant thing that happened. Probably a lot of things happened, but there's one thing that sticks out in my mind, and it has to do with a little picture that you had in your wallet, which you showed to my wife and my kids. You showed it to me, and the reason I'm thinking about this right now extemporaneously is because that phrase in your book, I want to give them the shirt off my back, you showed me a picture of someone that you, I think, if I remember the details, and you can correct me on this, but someone that I think you adopted, someone that you're supporting, not necessarily adopted into your direct family with your seven kids, but someone that you support. And you talked about the treasure of that. Maybe you can relate that, however the story really is, as you can better explain it, but you can relate that to what Jesus said. You know, if you give the cup of cold water or even the piece of bread in my name to the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. Yeah, I I think you're referring, my memory keeps getting worse and worse. Are you referring to the African gal? Yes, absolutely. Um, Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think it was our, my wife and I, on our 20-year anniversary we decided to go to Ethiopia because we just thought, you know, it's our 20 year, but our greatest memories are the times we've been overseas caring for the less fortunate. And there was this gal, I mean, it was the first time I saw like starvation, starvation, like any minute this girl is going to die. And I mean, just like all those worst pictures you've ever seen, the ribs protruding, the stomach distending because you know, the internal organs are being eaten by the stomach. And they just said, yes, yeah, she's not going to survive, but you can pray for her. You pray for a miracle, which is what I did. Going, God, would you just do a miracle here? Just have her survive long enough to hear the gospel so that she can worship you with these lips that you created, God. Would you save her soul? And sure enough, 
they were able to nurse her back to life. And her name is Sophie. And I just, just, she's just this beautiful girl that I get to, you know, every time I go back and visit, she's one of thousands that have really come back to life in a sense. I mean, they were just rotting away. And the joy of seeing her life and the joy of hearing her worship God. And, uh, you know, you just ball your eyes out like, God, she's singing to you. You answered my prayer. You know, I, I it's that, that oneness, that desire of, it's not hard to just want to be completely united with her. So I, it's not just a, as you, when you recognize there are so many people around the world that will never get a chance to even learn the alphabet. And for us to have a pride because of our education, like we have this corner on truth. If you spend enough time with the poor, there is something that is very humbling you begin to understand what Jesus said. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's this idea that it's about knowing this person, the person of Jesus, that Sophie knows Jesus. Even though her mind is not perfect anymore because of the starvation and everything else, her mind is not all there. And she won't be able to read all these brilliant books, you know, and she won't have this scholarly ability to, you know, graduate. But she knows truth because she knows Jesus. And I can be one with her, even though she's not going to ever understand some of the things that I do from an intellectual perspective. She is very capable and every bit as capable of knowing Jesus, who is the truth. And I guess for so much of my life, when I thought about knowing truth, I only thought about studying. And I thought about all the truth I don't know, because there are so many books that I haven't read and so many books I have read that I couldn't understand because my mind was not to that ability that capability. And so I think, oh, I can't know truth. But it's recently the Lord's shown me, no, just, just know me. I am truth. And you can know me. And the more you know me, the more you know truth. And that doesn't mean I don't study. It doesn't mean I wasn't reading this morning or listening to some very intelligent people, more intelligent than I am. But I'm just I just have a different understanding of truth now that I believe is more complete. You mentioned miracles just a moment ago. There was a time in which you didn't believe in miracles. Today, you do believe in miracles, and you've seen them with your own eyes. I think there's an example that you either told me personally or read about where you were in Myanmar, and you're ministering. I think it was Myanmar, formerly Burma, and you saw miracles take place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I saw from the Word of God, okay, there was a time when I was a cessationist, and I was just taught not to believe, you know, in these gifts, and I, I hadn't seen them anyway, so it was kind of, and most of the professors I talked to, I go, you sure? And they go, well, I don't know if I can defend it biblically, really, but I haven't seen them either, so I go, yeah, exactly, but we, we can't really defend it biblically, and so even my professors would admit it. But I, it was true of me, too. I'm going, biblically, I see this as possible. And I don't know anyone who doesn't want to see a miracle. I want it, but I just had never seen it with my own eyes until I was in Myanmar. And, and I think there was something special about going there united with some ministry partners whose theology was different from mine on what I believe to be secondary issues. But we fought to love each other and become one and not do the typical, oh, we disagree on this issue, so let's just go our separate ways. You know, we'll acknowledge that you are my brother and I'll see you in heaven, but we are pretty much going to keep each other at arm's length. 
And we say, you know, that's just not biblical. Let's love each other like Christ loved us. Let's seek perfect oneness, even though there's like an intellectual disagreement on these issues. And I believe God blessed that. I believe he commanded that blessing, like he talks about in in Psalm 133, about just how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And at the end of that psalm, he says that's where he commands his blessing life forevermore. And so we saw the miracles of people falling in love with Jesus who had never heard of him. But we also saw the power, and I prayed for it. I said, God, these people have never heard of Jesus. Here are these old ladies sitting at my feet, and through a translator, I am telling them who Jesus is for the first time in their lives. They are hearing the gospel, and I'm going, God, how could they possibly believe this without some sort of supernatural, whether it's internal or external. But God, I would love to see you authenticate this message with actual miracles. And it was the first time where I had people lining up for prayer and telling me what hurts. And I would pray for them and they were healed. And there have been times when I've prayed and I thought I had so much faith and and maybe I did, but I just, I've never really seen it. Like not immediately, but I'm telling you, like a woman with her face just so swollen and telling me about just how much pain she's in and I'm praying and she would tell me the pain is all gone. But then she says to me through the translator, can you tell them to get rid of the swelling now? I'm like, ooh, okay, this is physical now that I can see, you know? And I pray, and I'm looking at her face, and I'm going, it looks like the swelling is going down. And the translator looks at me, he goes, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I go, I think so. I go, let's keep praying. And I prayed again. And I'm looking at her and looking at the translator with my hands in the air like, and this whole thing look all perfectly normal to you because it does to me. He goes, that's what I was thinking. You know, it's those types of things where it was just one after the other where I really believe I was seeing the power of God right there in my face. And I believe it was because I mean, it's because of the grace of God, and he chooses to show mercy when he shows mercy. But I do think it was coupled with an obedience of going out and trying to reach those who have never reached. It wasn't just miracles so that we could see them just because that'd be fun. It was like, God, I want to authenticate your message. And I believe there was a blessing on the unity that we were pursuing. And so I thank God for that time. One of the things that you have raised as an issue, and by the way, I hope people will meditate on what you just said, but for purposes of the podcast itself, in your book, you talk about the problem with the seeker-sensitive model, and you focus primarily on hell becoming a taboo subject. Can you expand on that? Well, I guess it happened when I was a part of a church and was specifically told, hey, don't talk about that. And I think that became pretty popular thinking, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, as we began to just, we wanted people in our gatherings. And so there were things that we thought would freak them out. So talking about hell was one of those things. And so we thought, well, that is for maybe later when they're more mature and they can handle these things. There were were certain things about God that we just thought we want to hide because no one wants to hear about wrath. And so there was this, this time, which I understand some of the heart behind it. You know, some people were saying, gosh, you know, all we talk about is fire and brimstone, and we don't talk about the love of God. And so, 
you know, it doesn't make the good news sound like good news. But we swung it and just said, okay, let's not talk about the wrath of God, because that doesn't sound like good news to the average person. So let's just hide that part of God until they're more mature, until they receive Jesus as their friend and as their Savior, and then the Spirit is in them, and then they can handle some of these things. But, you know, the bottom line was, you know, I, I can't judge a person's motives, but it was this strategy that said, okay, what will bring the people in? What types of sermons will attract the average person? Because we want to get them in these buildings to hear the gospel message. And we want to keep them there. So what types of messages would keep them coming and keep them interested? And that is such a far cry from the way that Jesus taught and the abrasive things that he would say at the first gathering of these people. You know, when you have thousands of people and some of them going there to hear him for the first time, and he immediately has them count the cost. And he's confronting Pharisees right in front of them in, in such a harsh way. I just go, you know, Christ just laid it out there. It wasn't about what would people like to hear. It was about Jesus speaking truth. And then when he's done, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. I mean, if we really believe what he says in John 6, I believe 63 or 66, where he says it's the spirit who gives life and the flesh is of no help at all. You know, it's like what Jesus said, you know what, if you have ears to hear, you'll hear what I have to say, because I'm preaching truth, and my sheep will hear my voice. But for me to think in the flesh that by my eloquent speech, and maybe hiding certain things about God, and emphasizing the things I think you'll want to hear, and only teaching those things, that's using my flesh, like that's going to help somehow, rather than saying, God... You are a holy God. You are the coming judge. But you're full of mercy, too, and full of love. You are love. Help me to communicate the cross. Help me to communicate what you did. Help me to communicate what you're going to do when you come back as judge. Help me communicate this. And, and Lord, it's up to you. You have to draw these people to yourself. Father, draw them to Jesus today. And whether it's authenticating it through signs and wonders, or whether there's some sort of internal Holy Spirit moment that I can't even see, God, it's, it's really up to you. And so my job is just to convey truth, and then he who has ears, let him hear. And that's not the way we were taught in the 90s, most of us, as far as Whenever you go to a church growth seminar, you know, how to grow your church, that type of thing, it, it really swayed toward this human strategy of what we think might work. One of the things I love about you, Francis, is you truly are willing to follow truth wherever it leads, and your life has been emblematic of that. I mean, you were a mega church pastor. You walked away from that mega church, and you did that out of conviction. And then you had a different model for church growth. But you're willing to open yourself completely up to the leading of the Spirit as much as you are able. I mean, we're all incapacitated in that, in that regard to one degree or another. Can you talk a little bit about the church and how Christ gave his life for the church? how significant the church is, perhaps even why you walked away from a, a megachurch context and got involved in planting churches not only in San Francisco, but also in places like Hong Kong. Yeah, you know, and I, gosh, please, 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 everyone listening, I am not saying I have anything figured out. I just read things in the scriptures, and I get convicted about them, and I and look at how the church ought to be, and I don't even know how to get there. 
but I'm not afraid to say, gosh, this is not a small issue. You know, love one another seems to be the great command. It seems to be the thing that will cause the world to know that we are his disciples. And so we did many things at Cornerstone that I believe were just good and right, and we saw the fruit of that, that primary point of the church to display those one another so the world could see the love of Christ. I'm going, gosh, I don't feel like we're doing a good job of this. I don't, I don't see us doing a good job of everyone exercising their gifts, and you all have these manifestations of the Spirit for the common good. But in our current structure, I'm not allowing for that. Let's try some new things. And and yet I didn't even know how to do that. And as I tried to lead the church, I thought, oh, gosh, I feel like I'm hurting the church more than helping it. And and I don't even know what I'm, you know, I don't even know how to do this. And maybe the church is better off without me. And let me pursue something different without harming this current church. And let me go out and pursue something somewhere else. And maybe where fewer people have heard the gospel and eventually it was San Francisco. Let me try that. And, you know, I'm not afraid of that. Even right now, I'm going, gosh, we're in such a unique time, you know, as we're possibly coming off uh, the pandemic. Who knows? I mean, it seems like every day there's a new strain that is, you know, that might be, you know, uh, whatever you call it. It doesn't work with the, uh, the vaccinations. It just you don't know what the future is and how do we, you know, work and in tune with the Holy Spirit and, and really see the church be this unstoppable force, uh, no matter what happens in the world, that we would know how to gather and love each other. And even right now, I'm going, God, what do you want to do at this point in history, it doesn't mean that all of those other structures were wrong. It might have been right for those times. It's just, here's the goal. Here's the end goal, is this beautiful church that's united, equipped, full of love, and everyone can see it, and not blown and tossed by every wind of doctrine. So they're equipped. We want to get there. What is the best way in this time in this season um, to accomplish that. God, show us, show us, because everything's on the table. And I try to do that with my own life, saying, God, and I've been doing that with my kids recently, going, we will go anywhere on the earth. And right now, come on, family, let's just pray that God would direct us. But it all has to be on the table. And you guys have seen the moves that Dad has made. And it wasn't always the most logical or strategic for our well-being. But we've trusted that if God leads us somewhere, we're going to go and we're going to be blessed for it somehow. And you guys have seen how God has been faithful. So let's do it again. Let's surrender our own personal desires and say, God, we'll go anywhere and do anything. Please just give us wisdom or signs or just clear direction from you. And my kids were just like, I mean, I just praise God. I have a family that's that's all in because they have seen the faithfulness of God and the blessing of God when we follow, even when it's not where our flesh would naturally lead us. Some of this, as you've explained to me in the past, is born out of the sense of your own mortality. Can you talk about that for a moment? I mean, I've gone through a four-year battle with cancer, and so often you get on the other side of that, and you think you think you're going to live forever, and you forget your own mortality, and yet you have been given a very acute sense of your own mortality. Yeah, this was just a gift from the Lord, knowing that my mother died while giving birth to me. My dad sent me off to Hong Kong to live with my grandmother, but then he remarried, and I came back to the States and had a family again. But then my stepmother died when I was like seven or eight. She uh, died in a car accident. And then my dad got married again, and then he died of cancer when I was 12. And so when you're 12 years old, you're middle school, and you're 
burying your dad, after burying your stepmom, after realizing she wasn't even your real mom, your biological mom died at childbirth, you just grow up with this sense that, wow, how do I know that I'm going to be here tomorrow? So when I'm 12 years old and dealing with burying my dad and going back to school the next day and everyone's kind of living life and I'm going, man, anything can happen. I need to know what happens at the end. And so it started me, you know, those types of events just God naturally uses, you know, for you to think about your own mortality, then becoming a pastor. And as a pastor of a large church, you see many people die, young and old people, younger than you, older than you. You do funerals for little kids, and it just breaks your heart. And so your mind is just always there. And I like to live out, you know, what it says in Ecclesiastes, where, you know, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of feasting. And I think about the memorial services, and I warn them. I go, this is what Scripture says. You guys, right after, I know some of you, right after this memorial service, you're going to go out and get drunk. It's a big thing now. You go, you party, and you go, oh, he would have wanted me to do this. You know, and I go, gosh, King Solomon is saying that's, that's what a fool would do. You don't want to sit in the house of mourning. He, he says, because death is the destiny of every man. And the living should take this to heart. You should sit there and realize this is my destiny and to sit in that. And so when I see that in Ecclesiastes and I do all these funerals and I mean, it just happened again a couple of days ago. I don't have time for that whole story, but it's like, whoa, that person just died. I just so randomly and I was there and it's, it's like, oh, the passing of life and to sit in it because the Bible says that's the wise thing to do. But I think we don't want to do that. We're like those who get drunk after the funeral because we don't want to think about it. And we just want to celebrate and stay in the house of feasting. And so when you face death and when you're forced to think about your mortality like you were, you end up thanking God for it <laughs> because you realize what really lasts. That's why the book that my wife and I even wrote was like, uh, you and me forever marriage in light of eternity. It's like, I, this isn't a book about just, well, let's have a happy marriage here on earth. But we recognize we're going to be married in heaven and we're going to be in heaven at any moment. I'm going to see his face in any moment. So how do I live out marriage in light of my own mortality. And, um, yeah, it's become very natural for me and even supernatural because of the scriptures to think that this might be my last podcast with anyone and make sure I'm saying to everyone who's listening, please, please, please take this seriously and humble yourself before a mighty God and beg him to help you understand his love and forgiveness that's available to you, that you would know him and humble yourself before him and begin a true abiding in him and him abiding in you and becoming one with him. Like all of that can happen today. Don't get caught up in details of something Hank might have said or I might have said that might be off. I know Hank's heart, and it's similar to mine, where we were just saying, please understand what a great God we have and how outrageous his love is for us and how just fascinating this truth is that he says that if we love him, that the Father, and they will make their home in us, and the Spirit himself will live in us, and that he's knocking right now on that door, and we open that door, and he comes, and, and we experience life with him, because he is the life, and we dine with him, and we, we speak and do podcasts with him. 
I mean, he is just a part of everything we do, and we want that for you. Yeah, as you were talking, Francis, I was thinking about the last time I spoke in the midst of entering into a transplant. And so I was going to do a transplant. It was sort of a last-ditch effort to save my life. And I remember going to Annapolis, Maryland, and I was speaking in a church. I did a conference, and then I spoke on Sunday morning. And and I remember how different it was. The tumors had pretty much taken over my body. They'd even been protruding on the outside. I had one in my groin area that you could see. I had one under my jaw. I had one popping out of my neck. And I remember how different it was to speak in that circumstance because I was so aware that this might be the very last time I ever had an opportunity to do this. And therefore, I didn't take any moment of that that speech for granted. And the other thing that was really interesting and something you alluded to earlier, when you're in that condition, there's a selflessness that naturally takes over because now it's not about drawing attention to yourself. You're probably not going to be here very long. It's about allowing the Lord to shine through you. That becomes your focus. So it's not about how grandiose you can be with your words or how compelling, but Lord, please manifest your reality to these people gathered here. May your Holy Spirit touch them. May they see the Spirit of God alive in me. And I love that, that focus. And that's why when you said to me, when we were together, Pre-COVID, actually, you were leaving for Hong Kong shortly thereafter, and you started talking to me just before we spent some time in prayer. You start talking to me about this sense of your own mortality. And I, again, wanted to bring that out in the podcast because I think it's so important for people to realize that they're one heartbeat away from being in the presence of God. And one other thing in this vein that you might want to elaborate on, you know, when you think about being one heartbeat away from the presence of the Lord, and I went into a coma right after my transplant. I went into a coma because I caught an E. coli bacterium. That should have thrown a monkey wrench into the whole thing. But the one thing that I thought about after I came out of the coma was, what would the Lord have said to me if I didn't come out of that coma, if I was in his presence What would he have said to me about the poor and the downtrodden? Mm. And there's a whole world out there, and you've alluded to that in talking about Myanmar. There's a whole world out there in the 1040 window that's never heard the name of Jesus. I mean, 96%, I think, is the the statistic. 96% of the people in that swath of 1.6 billion people have never heard the name of Jesus. And many of them are poor. And so when you bring the love of Jesus Christ to them through food or water or clothing, you open their hearts to a Jesus they've never heard of. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, even as you say that I get convicted and I I want to spend my life well. I want to spend my resources well. Living in the U.S., I mean, we've been blessed. And it's not just so that we can enjoy all these things. And I mean, I do, I, I do think about eternity when I, you know, do my finances, when I decide what kind of car to buy. It's like, okay, what will I regret in heaven? Why decide what house to live in or or trailer or whatever? It's like, okay, what am I going to regret? Because that's, that's eternal, you know, what am I going to rejoice over? And it keeps me focused on my treasure in heaven. And, and it can't be just a guilt thing, too. It's out of love. It's out of desire. And so when I am overseas and, I, and I've met these people, it's like it's not like a chore to give to them. It's this desire. I just want to, I want to research and make sure I'm giving to the right groups and organizations, even that really are getting the gospel and getting relief out there. But I want to be generous. I don't want to be stuck at the end of my life with a bunch of possessions and go, it's almost like my actions prove or disprove what I say I believe. 
And so I even remember praying that years ago when I was shepherding down in Southern California. I go, God, I don't get how people can be so wealthy and then give 5 or 10% of their income to you. Why wouldn't they just live a normal life or, or sacrifice if they really believe in eternity? And saying, God, you know, give me a fortune and I'll give it away. And, then, you know, surprisingly, I did make a fortune through writing. And I go, okay, you know what? I'm still not going to buy a new car. I'm still not going to buy a big house. Like, I really am happier building hospitals. I really am happier knowing how many lives I've kept alive through feeding programs. I really am happier when I know how many times the gospel has been presented in these third world countries. And, and that I, I got a little, you know, piece of that just by financially giving. These are joys in life. And so the way we live really does matter. And I do think about coming before him. And so even right now, as you talk about that, I got to look at my finances again and go, okay, how much is in the bank? And do I really want that in the bank if we're coming towards the end here? And how do I get rid of it? And how do I get rid of it well in a way that honors the Lord and gets the gospel out to as many people as possible? I wrote a note on a sheet of paper that I have in front of me with respect to this podcast, and it says, must do on the podcast. So this is an absolute must do. And it says, go over the Lord's high priestly prayer as dissected by Francis on pages 89 through 92 of his book. And in the interest of doing that and hearing your comments, let me simply recite what the Lord said. We've alluded to it, we've paraphrased it, but our Lord said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, that's only a short piece of the Lord's high priestly prayer. Give us your thoughts. My thought is, it was so beautiful when you read it. It's just like water to my soul. And I I don't even want to expound on it. You know, I feel like sometimes I can try to uh, improve upon Jesus' words or something, or that he needs me to explain it and dissect it better for people. But, you know, this is the only book where the words are alive, like they're living and active. In my book on unity, the only words that are alive are the times when I quote scripture. And there's just something about the way when you read it, I'm just going to sound different from everything I've been saying on this podcast, everything you've been saying on this podcast, because these are the very words of Jesus. And so I, I'm just going to read them. I can read it again. Listen to this and picture Jesus saying this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one 
so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Amen. Amen. Yes. People can read about what you wrote about in your book in this regard. I think it's important. And again, let me, before I say anything else, just mention that this book is available for those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for for not only truth, but for the life that Francis is talking about. You can get the book for your support on the web at equip.org. You can also write me at box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. There's something that you alluded to earlier, you write about in your book that probably is a rather sharp segue in one sense, but I did want to discuss this, and that is how should Christians and Christian leaders respond to what's going on now in an internet age where you have internet trolls? And some of them are Christian trolls. And you've been, if I can say this in a sanctified way, you've been a victim of those trolls. They capitalize on the fact that you're reaching people, and then by latching onto you in a critical way, distorting truth, distorting reality, they cause further division within the body of Christ. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you, you see online the videos that get the most hits. And, you know, we understand that a lot of it is a matter of clickbait and uh, getting the right title on there. It's, I mean, in some ways it's just funny because sometimes we'll post a video that I do and then some other ministry will post the same video but have a better title and they'll get, you know, three times the amount of hits that we get. And you also realize that if you talk about certain issues, you'll attract more listeners. And so if someone, you know, some guy who doesn't have a lot of listeners puts a video online that says, why I love Jesus, that's not going to get that many hits. But if he puts Hank Hanegraaff, the man we trusted is now a heretic. <laughs> I want to click on that. <laughs> What's this guy have to say? And again, earlier, what I was saying about selfish ambition, uh, James 3, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, you know, so will disorder in every vile practice. And so what could be more vile than slandering those who are servants of God? But it, there's this ambition, why well, I, I want more people listening to me. And I'm not saying that that's the only motive and that anyone that ever rebukes someone else, that is their only motive. I get it. Like I said before, there have been times in my life I spoke against people out of ignorance. And yet in some ways in my heart, I thought I was doing it for Christ. But my lack of research, my lack of compassion, my lack of love just brought this destruction into the church. And so I just think we are in a time where people understand that, you know, if you say something accurately, you may not get as many followers as if you embellish something or use very scathing and strong words, because that's just the culture we live in. And so our, our words are becoming more and more abrasive. We aren't thinking about you know, what uplifts, and we aren't thinking about our testimony to the world and the division that we're showing them. I mean, if Jesus' high priestly prayer is that we've become perfectly one so that the world would see and believe that he was sent, it's similar to what Paul says, like, why would you have lawsuits amongst each other and that in front of unbelievers? The things we're doing in front of unbelievers and the things that we're saying that may make sense to us in our little circle, it's hurting the church and it's destroying the testimony that we have in the world. And maybe we're just ignorant of, of how the world sees it and, and how much pain we've caused servants of God who really are trying their best and really are seeking after the Lord at times. 
And that's not to say there isn't a time to confront, but I am saying, okay, let's do it. Humility, gentleness, love. And let's even ask ourselves the question, how am I so sure that my interpretation of Scripture is right and his or hers is wrong? Are you sure you're more intelligent than me? Are you sure you're more spirit-filled than me? Or are you sure you're more humble than me? And that's why God has given you an accurate interpretation and given me a faulty one. Um, you have to you have to answer these basic epistemological questions of why do I know truth better than he does? You know, there's just, there's just a lot. That's why the Bible says not many of you should be teachers because you'll be judged more harshly. These are some things that we need to think through more seriously before we just speak out against people. There's so much we could have done in this podcast. I mean, we actually started out, at least I did, asking the question about what is essential and what is non-essential. We could have talked about our Lord Jesus Christ saying, this is my body. This is my blood. If you don't partake of my body and blood, you have no life in you. We could have had a discussion about about what is essential and what is non-essential. But instead, you refocused the discussion on the heart. Where's your heart? And you discuss a lot of these matters in your book in terms of essentials and non-essentials. But the primary place is your heart for crazy love, <laughs> as you call it, your heart for love and humility, your heart for being on our knees so that we see the best in our brothers and sisters rather than the worst, your heart for mission. And through all of that, if we get our hearts in the right place, we can start talking about unity, not from the standpoint of, I got you on this particular issue, or you got me on this, or, you know, show where, I mean, I can read your book and say, you know, there are a bunch of places that you might have been more careful, maybe, but that's not really where, and I'm not trying to be critical here, Francis, but, but, that, but that's not really the issue. The issue is, can we get our hearts to the right place? And if we get our hearts to the right place, then we can talk about the impossible dream becoming a possible dream, and that is unity in our own lifetimes, which is something that you actually say you have the childlike faith to believe could happen. Amen. Amen. And I hope that's what people get from this. And it doesn't mean we don't discuss those other things. And who knows? I mean, we're all going to, at best, see as in a mirror dimly. And once we understand that and go, okay, God, I'm I'll see as clearly as I can down here, and let's let's spur one another on, and let's sharpen one another. But as we do that, let's do it in a spirit of love and unity. Absolutely. Francis, I love you, my brother. you got a great wife and a great family and a great vision for how your life can be used. And you've put out a book, and that book is going to cause a lot of people to think about the heart of Christ when he prayed to the Father that we might be one so that the world would believe that the Father sent the Son. Thanks for your friendship, and thanks for your insights on this edition of Hank Unplugged. Yeah, thanks, Hank. Love you. Love you as well. Francis Chan, again, the book, Until Unity. You can get your copy on the web at equip.org. As I said before, you can also write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28. 271. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you next time with more.